This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. The subject is bison restoration, and I have uh, a man who's with the Buffalo Field Campaign, and we'll be talking about bison, where they've been, and where they're going. So like once a week? The issue is bison restoration. I have Tom Woodbury from the Buffalo Field Campaign, and we'll be talking about everything bison, pro and con. Uh, so welcome, Tom. What I'd like to do is give my guests uh, a little time to give a background about themselves uh, and uh, whatever it is in relation to the subject matter that we're talking about. So if you could give a little background about yourself and the Buffalo Field Campaign. Sure. Um, so I'm originally from Chicago and went to college at Southern Illinois, um, studied science and math and ended up getting a degree in communications and going on to law school and moving out west and um, started out as an environmental lawyer in 1985. <clears throat> and um, one of my duties uh, in that job was um, to follow uh, what, what eventually became called climate change back then, global warming, and the ozone hole. And it's just the beginning of when things started to unravel. Eventually, I kind of got the big picture and um, took some time off and went backpacking overseas for a year. And, and then knocked around the parks in the West for another year or so, and um, and then got into um, um, eco activism, beginning in Idaho uh, during uh, actually what what caused me to come out and start practicing law again was the salvage rider in uh, 1995 when when Bill Clinton uh, suspended all the laws protecting our forests. So that's when I knew it was. It was a hopeless cause. It was a good time for me to get involved, and <laughs> and uh, I've been so I had a pretty successful career um, suing the Forest Service and um, shutting down old growth logging in Idaho and Montana and Washington and Utah and uh, Washington and uh, and then um, and then I switched over, sort of started transitioning out of law. I started focusing on public land uh, grazing issues, public lands grazing issues, cows, and for a Western Watersheds Project. And then um, I'd say about 2009 or so, I just started feeling like nothing was making sense to me in light of the climate, the seriousness of the climate crisis. I didn't feel like our tactics were up to the task. And had a lot of, I started, found myself arguing with people like Bill McKibben about our tactics and uh, uh, felt like a little frustrated, so, but also sort of confused and befuddled by just our um, overall societal pathology in relation to the climate crisis. So I went back to school at California Institute of Integral Studies and also. Um, a long time Buddhist at that point and um, started doing hospice service at Zen Hospice. And um, I wrote a paper called Planetary Hospice in 2014 that went viral. And um, that started me on a, almost a decade long research and writing um, journey um, to figure out the psychology underlying the climate crisis. And uh, eventually, <laughs> Actually, during the pandemic, I synthesized. I wrote in, then I wrote a paper in two thousand and nineteen called "Climate Trauma," uh, um, towards a new a new um, taxonomy of trauma, and that also went viral more in academic circles, um, and um, was taken up by Extinction Rebellion at the time, and and sort of um, got a lot of play, and so I felt like I had successfully diagnosed the. Um, societal pathology or illness, and that it was therefore incumbent on me to try to um, prescribe a course of treatment. And, and then eventually that resulted in um, the synthesis in a, of all my writing and research in a book that's freely available, that I made freely available online called uh, Climate Trauma, Reconciliation and Recovery. And, and then when I finished that, my plan was to retire and uh, go find a nice cave in the Himalaya somewhere and um, make good use of the rest of my life. <laughs> but I, I kind of uh, got drawn back to Montana 
by a good friend of mine that was a co-founder is co-founder of the Buffalo Field Campaign. Um, they'd been through some trauma, organizational trauma of their own during the pandemic, and needed um, someone to come in and um, sort of um, handle communications with media and things like that. And so I just started in August, uh, September. And so I'm just kind of getting situated, situated in that. And Buffalo Field Campaign has been around for 25 years, was co-founded by Mike Meese, who's still the campaign coordinator, and Rosalie Little Thunder, uh, Lakota, a Lakota spiritual leader and um, former executive director of the Seventh Generation Fund, um, who we all learned so much from. And Rosalie passed on um, in about 2015. And, um, and now we're, uh, in the, about three years ago, um, um, a Nez Perce uh, environmental scientist and, and leader, spiritual leader of his tribe, um, James Holt, became the executive director for Buffalo Field Campaign. And so we're kind of moving, traditionally, it was a reactionary organization because of the mistreatment of bison in Montana by law enforcement officers. That's what gave rise to the campaign. Uh, over time, we've succeeded in, in securing year-round habitat for bison outside of the park in Montana. And, and, and the slaughter has kind of, at least for now, um, gone away. Uh, and so we're sort of shifting our focus in, in response with, to the climate crisis. And that's one of the reasons I was brought in here to uh, eco restoration and getting wild bison um, on public lands outside of Yellowstone National Park. And, um, and also doing a lot of tribal outreach and working with tribal youth programs and so forth to reconnect, recon, reconnect or re um, forge that relationship, that severed relationship between the tribes and the bison. And so we're sort of just at the beginnings of that, that process. And, so, and, so let me just pick up because there's a lot that you brought in there. When you talked about law enforcement, are you, is, is this something, something that law enforcement officers are allowing poaching or looking the other way? No, no. Um, so, so what happened was um, um, Montana had a policy, the Department of Livestock in Montana on behalf of the ranchers had a policy of basically killing every bison that came across um, the park boundary uh, for many years. And that's, that's um, so that was uh, law enforcement officers for the Department of Livestock working in conjunction with, you know, sheriff's, sheriff's office and, and to some extent, um, Park Service law enforcement officers as well. So that, that was the dynamic there for many years. But they were allowing, but I mean, is there no protection outside of the boundaries of the park? There was not at that time. Uh -huh. uh, there is, there is now. So you uh, mentioned that uh, you were both a lawyer and a Buddhist, which kind of seems uh, sort of at odds uh, uh, if you're being cynical. Yeah. And yeah. don't forget the psychologist. Okay. But uh, uh, so in terms of what, were you just frustrated with the, the, the constant legal fights and then being thrown up and that you, is this more direct action that you're now involved in with the Buffalo Field campaign? No, actually not. Um, no, I was frustrated with uh, just the overall failure of the environmental movement over the course of time that I was involved in it, right? I mean, I just felt like the tactics of marching and getting arrested and, you know, it was not up to the task when it comes to the climate crisis, or at least not the way we were approaching. And I think Extinction Rebellion sort of, um, you know, put a different twist on all of that. But it, it was just the overall, like, what are we doing? You know, like, <laughs> it just seems like conservation had become a profession. And, uh, you know, I started out in, in governmental service and realized that that wasn't the answer. And, and eventually I got to the point in, um, uh, through the conservation movement where I just felt like this is not the answer either, you know. Um, so. what, part, what part do you think that public apathy and the general American attitudes anti-science these days or throughout the country's history have played in that. I mean, whether we're talking about people refusing to wear masks, 
uh, the t right to abortion being taken away for women, the eternal, you know, uh, this Flint, this com this county, this city, there's some kind of economic disaster. Uh, there seems, as you said, I mean, I, I was born in 1965. I remember the first Earth Day as a child. And in the half century plus since then, I mean, we're, you know, it's, it's Nero fiddling while Rome's burning. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't, I don't disagree with that. I think that, uh, you know, around the turn of the century there, in the early 2000s, you know, the environmental movement sort of did a lot of self-reflection, and many of us came to the conclusion that it was basically a failure, you know. We, we were losing ground, and uh, um, we weren't winning the hearts and minds of, of the American people, which we have to do, you know. So that's when I realized, well, I knew from the start, Dan, that all of the all of my work in the environmental movement was addressing symptoms of some underlying disease. And eventually, I think early on, I felt like it's a spiritual disease. And, you know, there's something wrong kind of, you know, uh, politically incorrect thing to say, but there's something um, off about our mass psychology that's causing us to act in very self-destructive ways. So, so that, and, and I didn't, feel like, you know, um, yeah, marching in the streets and getting arrested was was changing that at all. Uh, it just kind of almost made it easier for people to, you know, go go to the march and then come back home to your comfortable lifestyle and forget about it. <laughs> yeah, I uh, we will get to the bu Buffalo in one second, but I know I've often uh, thought of that uh, uh, things aren't going to get better until they get worse. It'll probably be mid-century when uh, there's, uh, we see noticeable rises in the sea. And I, I think Greenland is melting a lot quicker than people think. You know, they say, oh, it, it's exceeding projections. Well, you can only have projections if you have, if you know what happened in the past. We don't know what happened in the past. And my, my sense is that, you know, it's probably going to be mid-century and then it's going to take a World War II level effort by all the major powers uh, to do this and, and get off their asses. It's not until... The, the the actual people in uh, Western society, you know, it discomforts them. If, you know, if some little Pacific Island uh, uh, archipelago goes under the water, who cares, you know, if, if you're living in, in Rome or, or, or New York or San Francisco or London or, or Paris, but once it hits home, it will. And, uh, you know, do you have that same kind of feeling? So... I think what you raise, you're raising a really interesting point, which will probably, which might be a good way of transitioning into, uh, you know, back into a discussion on the bison and and what I'm doing here. But what what I've I've written a little bit about, um, and and others have as well in academia is, is that one of the big mistakes that we've made, and one and so when I say you know our tactics were not effective you know why is that well it's it's very interesting when you get right down to the sort of psychology and the ethics of the whole thing that what we have in uh as a sort of a reflex sense of responsibility is is called uh mm, i think distributive responsibility or what more traditionally like our notions of responsibility accord with our notions of litigation so somebody is to blame, you know, and it's it's the big 25 corporations. They're the ones that are the cause of the climate crisis. And so we should protest against them or get on their boards or whatever. That's, um, you know, in some, for some areas of environmental law, um, that model of distributed responsibility makes sense. Um, in, in this context, it's kind of disempowering. The appropriate model for something like a crisis like the climate crisis is, is shared responsibility, which is not focused on who's to blame, but focused on what the causes are and, and what needs to happen going forward without regard to how we got here. You know, like if you were facing an actual emergency, you wouldn't, you know, your house is on fire. You're not going to sit there and argue over how the fire started. You're going to get the fuck out of the house and call the fire department or whatever. Or if a tsunami is coming, you're not going to argue about who who, whose idea was it to come here on this beach, you know, you're, you're going to like grab a, you know, you're going to get to higher ground, right? And 
So a sense of, if we had a sense of shared responsibility, kind of like what we had in World War II, you know, with Victory Gardens and everybody doing their bit, that's the appropriate model of responsibility. Our model of responsibility is very paternalistic. It's very much like the government should save us or the corporation should do good or whatever. It's always looking for somebody to, to sort of rescue us. And instead of recognizing that the, this is a crisis of our lifestyle <laughs> and we need to change our lifestyle in, in response to this crisis and do everything we can to reduce our you know, to our contribution to the to the crisis. Like, if we had that sort of sense of shared responsibility, then um, then it would we wouldn't be in this. We probably wouldn't be in the uh, situation we're in. You know, instead we kind of give our power away to corporations and the government, and and then just you know scream about them not doing anything. Well, let us return to speak about the bison. Um, so, uh, in looking through uh, uh, global warming and climate issues. Uh, one of the things that I started, uh, this is the second show that I did. I did a show a month or so ago about uh, the importance of beavers uh, in terms of water preservation and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and the term keystone species comes up a lot. So uh, let's mm -hmm. talk about uh, what uh, the American bison at least is, often called the buffalo, but truly a bison different than say the water buffaloes of India or uh, Africa. What is a bison? How did it evolve? And how is it an integral part of its own ecosystem? Well, um, so the bison is a mega herbivore, a large sort of uh, vegetarian kind of species that um, came over, probably came over from Europe around the end of the Ice Age. Um, I think probably around the time when there was still woolly mammoths around. It was much larger and you know, much larger animal back then. And then uh, in response to um, uh, co it, it came into a co-evolutionary relationship with uh, people, the first peoples that lived here and before horses. And, um, and it started uh, becoming smaller in response to being chased <laughs> by, by humans with spears, basically. Uh, so over time, so Native, Amer Native Americans, uh, first peoples and the bison co-evolved on the, on the landscape. Uh, at one point, there was at least 25 million bison from coast to coast and probably closer to 60, 60 million. Um, so, when you think in terms of evolutionary terms, basically the bison and and uh, and people um, uh, shaped the lands to a large extent. So, bison uh, have an, um, basically have a relationship. There's two types of bison. There's woods bison and plain bison, and what we what most people are familiar with are are the plains bison, and um, they basically. Um, shape the wildlife and, and, and vegetation landscape of North America um, with their, the way they graze, the way, they, um, the way their um, hooves um, till the soil, the way they fertilize the soil and spread seeds, um, the way they create wallows and drier end up um, being catchments for water and creating, you know, habitat for um, ephemeral critters uh, in the water, um, and of course, you know, the the way they, uh, the everybody sort of is familiar with how Native Americans used every every sort of piece of the bison when they would kill them uh, to build their teepees and to fill their dinner plate their dinner pots and. Uh, to clothe themselves and to make um, weapons and you know um, pots and everything you know like uh, the actual common Native American word for for bison uh, literally translates as everything. So the bison was everything to those people, and they actually didn't have the same sort of sense uh, of superiority. Um, that we tend to have, we Westerners tend to have towards the animal 
animals. They they literally they truly saw buffalo and American and American Indians refer to bison as buffalo, and that so that's why from a cultural standpoint it's probably more appropriate to refer to them as buffalo. But um, you know the scientific name is bison, bison, bison. Um, but they saw buffalo as their brothers and sisters, and and actually. Um, Shaped, they actually observed bison and the way they structure the herds and their family structures and pattern their own uh, social structures after what they observed with bison. Um, they call themselves like Rosalie, you know, our co-founder from the Lakota, they call themselves Buffalo people. And when they saw what was happening to the way the Buffalo were being treated in Montana, you know, that just re-traumatized them. That just brought up all of the ecocide and genocide trauma that they'd already experienced watching basically cowboys um, forcing bison to stay, buffalo to stay on the reservation and then indiscriminately slaughtering them when they would come off of the reservation, right? It was, buffalo became a proxy for the Indian Wars and, you know, that kind of generational trauma is still very much a part of the landscape here. So uh, a couple of things, when you talk about uh, evolving uh, the Native American culture, evolving with the buffalo, I know, I know that uh, there have been found early on as the various uh, peoples of Asia across Beringia, uh, or some, some people would argue that they sailed along the coast, uh, that there were, there were animals, uh, especially the bigger ma animals, the, the megafauna, the the, the rhinos, the woolly rhinos, the woolly mammoths, uh, the mastodons, uh, uh, smilodon, the, the saber-toothed cat, uh, that, that there, was, there is a pretty good correlation between when human beings arrived and within a few centuries, those animals going extinct in that area. So at, when, when Native American ancestors first came over, they didn't have this. This is something that, as you said, evolved, that, that they did. I mean, the earliest people... They were just, you know, doing indiscriminate killing too, because I know in Alberta, for example, they have found, uh, you know, hundreds of, of dead bison from 12, 15,000 years ago, what, you know, driven off a cliff, a very wasteful thing when you're talking about everything or that, that the name means the all. So this is something that over centuries and eons would have evolved. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And it's interesting that you mentioned the sort of buffalo jumps, um, I was actually just very recently at a an area um, called the Story Ranch in Montana, uh, where there we have archaeologists are studying the um, buffalo jumps there. And there's cairns. There's like a whole system for like directing herds, um, and uh, probably mostly crow crow tribe. Um, in that area, Paradise Valley, actually, and uh, you know, it, you're you're right that that, you know, so in co-evolving over time, you might imagine that at some point they would just run them off a cliff like that, and then just deal with the um, the pieces afterward. But what what I learned from um, from some of the Crow cultural historians uh, is that actually they. Um, more or less mimicked what wolves do and they would uh, run the bison parallel to the cliffs because the matriarchs and the major bulls would be in the front and they wouldn't want to take those members of the herd out because that's where the herd you know they rely on the herds rely on the the wisdom and knowledge of those um the matriarchs in particular so they would sideswipe the cliffs and and the weaker members of the herd would go off the sides of the cliffs and there wouldn't be an over harvest and so um so that's an example of sort of co-evolving right where like oh we first we, they discovered they could run them off a cliff and then they realized well you know we don't really want to do it that way if we're going to like disrupt the herd because we we if we rely on the herd and and we relate to we're in relationship with that herd so we don't want to take out the matriarchs you know so that would be an example, I think a good example of um, what co-evolution means. So uh, buffaloes, American buffaloes or bison are considered uh, probably the last of the American megafauna. Um, and 
I know that that I've looked up also and found uh, what's called the, the Mammoth Restoration Project in in Russia, uh, and the idea being that one of the ways to combat uh, global warming would be to restore what was known as the Mammoth Step uh, thousands of years ago, wherein you had the mammoths and the mastodons and the rhinos and and the buffaloes uh, would instead of uh, as a way to to keep uh, the tundra frozen, they would they would uh, pat down or, uh, and and by constantly running over the the snow the new snow that would fall, you wouldn't get the snow acting as a a warming blanket. So is there is there some uh, overlap between uh, the idea of the mammoth uh, step? restorations uh, in Asia and what you want to do with the uh, bison here in America and or the North America? Well, there is, of course, if essentially the reason that things are so out of whack, the reason that we, we're in crisis is because we're not, because we've upset all the appropriate natural relationships. And, and so primarily our relationship with the entire planet. Um, so, so then we we started approaching this as a scientific problem. There's, you know, we're we're emitting, we're burning fossil fuels, we're emitting all the CO2. Um, the atmospheric levels are increasing. Um, we need to bring them, you know, we need to stop, and then we need to like reverse that process. And so, we've gotten to a point now where because the governments are not listening to scientists and people are not people in the developed world are not modifying their lifestyles quick enough um there's already too much co2 in the atmosphere um and there there's no way no matter how quickly or slowly or whatever we decarbonize our economy and stop emitting fossil fuels there's still, there's still no escape from the crisis until we draw carbon back out of the atmosphere. And the best way to do that is to work with natural processes, work with basically the ecosystems that you're in, identify the keystone species in those ecosystems, um, support those species, whatever they are, whatever the ecosystem is, support the keystone species, and then then everything naturally flourishes and, and massive amounts of carbon can be drawn down. So just to give you, just to put that in some sort of perspective, some sort of pragmatic perspective, um, I can assure you that um, right now there are, there are many ecologists and scientists that are actually prioritizing grasslands up and down the front range from Mexico to Canada to decide, you know, which ones are um, most in need of restoration, which ones would benefit the most from getting bison back on there. And they've made sort of napkin type of um, calculations that if we were to get bison on all of these grasslands, you know, that are available, restore all of that grassland habitat, that would actually draw down twice as much carbon as we emit as a country every year. Mm. So that's, that's sort of the ceiling. And that shows you the potential of working with Gaia, the living organism that we're a part of uh, as an ally, rather than <clears throat> treating her as some sort of object or a test tube that we're, we're doing some grand experiment on. Yeah, I I was found it interesting in seeing a sort of videos reading up on certain things, both about bison and mammoth uh, step restoration, was that uh, the tundra, or rather the, the step lands with tundra, actually store more carbon and methane than the boreal forest, which sure. for 20, 30 years, I had always... Uh, I've been you, you'd read in the late 90s that the boreal forests were next to the Amazon and maybe the Congo uh, and maybe some other... Uh, you know, rainforest that they would that you know the whole thing plant a billion trees kind of thing. Um, do you think yeah. one of the mm -hmm. reasons that there is uh, this disconnect between the masses and people who work in ecology is this this constant sort of like well, uh, this year we're told this, five years from now we're told you know first first forests were good, now grasslands are better. 
that you get a public that just turns off to it? Well, I don't think so. I mean, climate science is a relatively new scientific discipline. It didn't exist when I started studying the problem, you know. It didn't really, it, it was a response to kind of, uh, oh, there's a hole in the ozone layer, you know, how did that happen? And and things are starting to heat up. So, you know, it's only in our lifetime, right, like um, that this discipline of climate science has even uh, begun. And there's thousands of scientists around the world working on it, but it's we it's just one of those things where you're dealing with things on this scale um, where you science basically admits that um, yeah and the more we discover the, the more we realize we don't really know or or you know we're the whole thing of science is you have to question your assumptions right so um, those are actually positive developments and you know I don't I don't think that's the reason people are rejecting science. I think people are rejecting science because it's an uncomfortable truth. You know, it's just like um, it basically is questioning their own, not just their assumptions, but their whole worldview. You know, um, that's I think climate science is basically saying this is a relational issue. We need to change all of our relations, and people are too comfortable in their. Um, their um, unhappy relationships to, to want to change them. But do you think that, that let's just keep it to America, people, you know, they used to have cable TV, now they've got streaming services, everyone, you can't, young people under 30, you can't go two minutes without looking at their cell phone. Do you think that in this kind of world where you get this over flood of, you know, I mean, if you look up on Facebook news app, you know, you're more, more likely to see something about a celebrity nipple slip than anything about, you know, uh, uh, carbon in the atmosphere or, or, or something, you know, um, do you, where, where do you think that, uh, uh, well, cer certainly, uh, certainly we're part of a consumer culture that's, been, that's premised on distraction. <laughs> I mean, that, that's the consumer culture and that's reality, but, uh, you know, to, to blame that sort of on, uh, sort of the inner, the advent of the internet, we, we get that every time there's a new media, right? Radio is going to like ruin everything. Television is going to ruin everything. You know, it's, it's from my perspective, you know, um, the internet, it's a double-edged sword. I mean, sure, there's all this, it, it, there's all this, you know, nonsense on there and, it, and a lot of wasted potential. But my goodness, you know, it's, it's also a great source of information and, and a way of informing yourself if you have any, any discriminating awareness whatsoever. You know, and you're not just sort of going along to get along. So, no, I, I think that, you know, it's it's kind of like, um, you know, we wouldn't have had an Arab Spring without uh, Facebook or whatever, mm -hmm. right? You know, I mean, uh, these these media are just that. They're media and, and they're, they're subject to, uh, just like with any technology, you know, it can be used um, for good or evil. I want to talk a little bit about more recent history rather than going back to, uh, uh, you know, paleo times. Uh, so when Europeans first uh, came to America and then spread out into the center of the country, you know, there are those famous photographs with, with the skulls of bison that sort of are mindful of, of what uh, Genghis Khan or Tamerlane did with the skulls of their enemies, you know, piling, you know, these these heads up like in, into giant pyramids. Um, and, and you see this over and again, I mentioned, I, I did a show on beavers. The same thing happened with the be beavers were hunted to almost extinction here uh, because so much of their, their uh, existence is valuable. The same thing happened with the baleen and the sperm whales uh, in the 19th century. Uh, and, you know, dozens of other uh, well-known animals, not only in America, but across the globe. Um, uh, so is is that slaughter uh, that that wanton wastefulness is that endemic to uh, say capitalism or corporatism uh, or, or is that something that's a deeper human problem beyond po the politicization? So um, yeah, it's interesting. The the, the bison. Actually, Buffalo came under pressure prior to that, um, prior to the Indian Wars, let's say, because of the Industrial Revolution. At some point 
early on, they found, they discovered that bison hide was much tougher than cowhide. And for the conveyor belts in the factories, bison became a pri bison hide became prized. And all of a sudden, you know, trappers were getting uh, good money for, for killing bison in order to fuel um, an industrial revolution. So that, that actually preceded. And then also, also just from a, a more cultural standpoint, um, when people used to back in the Northeast, right, where most of America was, and people would go around in their horse and buggies, uh, it became a, a, a status symbol to have uh, a bison hide uh, as a blanket. And if you had a white buffalo hide, you know, then that was like super, um, that was super status, you know? So, so there was that pressure as well. But it wasn't until after the Civil War um, when basically you had a flood of traumatized soldiers coming out west and that couldn't stop killing. <laughs> you know, to me, that's the real story of what happened. Uh, if you go back and look at what was happening in those times, uh, around the time, let's say, of, of discovery of gold in the Black Hills, you know, America was in a depression, like much like the Great Depression of the 30s. And they didn't quite, and they had already made all these promises, you know, to to the tribes about um, keeping their sacred places and stuff. But, but they, they, they felt like they didn't have any choice but to um, violate those, um, those promises in order to uh, save the economy. And then, so there's the capitalist part of it, I guess, but but then, but then more sort of more venally when when we when our government uh, after after the civil war adopted a genocidal policy towards uh, Indian Indians, um, then they realized pretty quickly uh, and this during a time of you know railroads coming out and everything like that that um, the best way to to um, uh, subvert the unruly Indians was to uh, kill all of the bison. Yeah. Um, so that was just genocide, ecocide. Um, yeah, you'd uh, mentioned you'd mentioned the the buffaloes as a de facto proxy for Native Americans. There, I guess the 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 underlying theme would have been like if if the buffalo uh, was the the underpinning to a society, you knock off the buffalo, and the the society will fall with it. Right. I mean, this was a time when our, I think our Secretary of Defense said the only good Indian is a dead Indian. And um, Was that Seward? I think that's right. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, another traumatized, you know, soldier from the world. I think that we, you know, we, we have this really, this, this wonderful myth about the old West, which covers up the reality of, of uh, severe trauma that we um they have, still haven't quite processed from the Civil War, right? I mean, it's all the white supremacy is, is back and fashionable again. Until you resolve traumas, they just keep popping up and you keep acting out on them, you know? And I, I feel like that's been the story uh, of America more than anything, especially since the Civil War. So um, let's talk about uh, when historic, historically recovery started. I know that, you know, even up to... Uh, President Teddy Roosevelt, uh, he was a famous hunter, a big game hunter. Yet on the other side, he probably did more ecologically in his time. And even, even I don't think there's any president since him that has been as ecologically tuned in uh, as Teddy Roosevelt had been. Um, uh, did, did the idea to save the buffalo start around uh, the turn of the 20th century? Uh, and gi give me sort of a, a, a brief precy of uh, the last century or so in that regard. So, so it's kind of like good luck or fate that bison did survive. It wasn't, there weren't many. <laughs> it was like, they didn't go the I mean, way of the passenger pigeon, so. Yeah. I mean, part of that was because Yellowstone National, before Yellowstone National Park was created, that, that um, they found refuge in there about, a couple of dozen. And then there were um, some um, conservation minded ranchers, you know, uh, that also uh, recognized what was happening and, and sort of uh, kept some bison protected. Eventually those two, uh, and there was one particular rancher who had a small herd of a couple of dozen bison and 
and they knew about the bison in the park and they brought them together and um, which is why we basically have two distinct genetically distinct herds in the park right now um, but the so the park itself this is the 150th anniversary of uh, the creation of Yellowstone National Park mm. by Teddy Roosevelt that was the first national park in the world that was a new idea the idea of of, of setting aside uh, an ecologically significant area for protection from uh, resource exploitation or, exploitation or, or uh, homesteading or whatever. Um, and when they create, and, and by the way, for people who are really interested in this, there's a, a current 94-page uh, article in the Wyoming Law Review called Reindigenizing Yellowstone, which is fascinating, has all of the sort of history of, 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 um, uh, of the creation of the park, the relation to the tribes at that time, the show bands were actually living in the park and were evicted um, by, by the park service. Um, and um, so that was, you know, around, so, so they started out with maybe 50 uh, uh, buffalo total left from um, 50 million or 60 million. And, um, and you know, it just became a feature of, of the national park. And, um, and of course, they excluded hunting uh, for any wildlife in the park. So they created this refuge. And over time, the bison recovered. Um, just to give people some idea, they, scientists believe that, or biologists believe that a minimum viable population for um, buffalo and a lot of uh, similar species is uh, about 3,000. So um, at some point, uh, yeah, well, I, I don't know exactly when they got past, but like I say, there's two herds in the park right now. We have more bison in the park now than we've had since um, the ecocide was carried out. So since the park was created, there's about 5,000 um, buffalo in the park right now. But one of the herds is actually in decline. One of the herds is actually in trouble. Um, and the other herd is, is um, more robust, uh, which long-term affects the potential for genetic diversity. Whenever you go through a bottleneck, the human species itself went through a bottleneck like that after a, a giant uh, volcano 80,000 years ago, it reduced population to about 10,000 in the world, um, then that creates a genetic issue. Um, and so the park right now, um, we have Fish and Wildlife Service um, studying the threats to um, buffalo's um, future viability. Uh, and with, uh, in other words, whether to determine whether or not they should be listed as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. Um, and that determination probably be made within the next year, um, probably next summer sometime. Uh, so, but um, the politics keep shifting and the Park Service right now is, um, is uh, basically looking it, because what happened in the um, what happened in the '90s when when Montana was was slaughtering bison indiscriminately, there was one particular event where they all lined up on horses in a circle. They circled a big herd of bison and just killed them all, and it got a worldwide media attention and embarrassed the state. The state sued the Park Service, saying, "You know, it's your." you're the problem, that you're the reason we have to kill a bison <laughs> because you're not managing them correctly. And so they ended up having this interagency bison management plan. Um, and that's been a source of controversy um, for many years. We don't have to get into all that. But presently, what you have is a park service looking at the science, not, you know, the previous population management was based on the wishes of the livestock industry in Montana didn't have any real scientific basis, you know. Um, they would say, oh, we don't want more than 3,000 or 5,000 bison in the park or whatever. 
Now um, they're saying the actual capacity for Yellowstone is probably about twice the number of bison that are in there right now. So there's no reason for any sort of slaughter. And there already are hunting pressures on bison when they come out of the park because the tribes have been reasserting their treaty rights to come back into relationship with the bison by, um, by coming out and hunting bison and taking them back to the reservations and changing their diets. There's also a program for, uh, for removing bison from the park and, and, and giving them to certain tribes like the Fort Peck tribe uh, in Montana has a herd of bison and other, so these, these bison are the most natural buffalo. You know, you see buffalo around the West, right? But a lot of them have a lot of cattle genes um, uh, and they're not, and, or they've lost, they're not wild, they've lost, they've been domesticated and have lost their certain instincts. This is like, you know, the best bison in the world, basically, right? So there's great potential here for using this herd to see other herds, um, create, you know, obviously get them out onto, um, into the Buffalo Commons and, and Kansas and, and, and Nebraska and those areas or down into Texas for that matter. You have bison down there and lots of grasslands down there that, that would benefit from having a lot of bison on them. Um, so, um, so the politics are shifting. Unfortunately, here in Montana, the politics have kind of gone in the other direction with, with Gianforte becoming our governor and, uh, and, and basically saying, we're not gonna follow science anymore. I don't believe in science. And so he's taken sort of one of the world's best fish and wildlife uh, agencies, uh, Montana has, has always been a world, you know, the Teddy, uh, the Teddy Roosevelt uh, uh, hunting, hunting Institute is here in Montana. Um, we've always been renowned around the world for the science um, that comes out of our Fish and Wildlife Service and, and our governor is basically dismantling all of that and, um, and, and you know, opposes any, any sort of progressive uh, moves on bison. So, so we, but at the same time, there's incredible pressure now, with the, especially with the biodiversity conventions that are about to be adopted in December. Um, this whole idea of eco restoration, as I explained before, you can't se you can no longer separate the um, biodiversity crisis from the climate crisis, and scientists get that. The United Nations and IPCC gets that, and so the whole Hopefully, once those biodiversity conventions are adopted, that will free up a lot of um, you know money and resources to go into eco restoration, to sort of mo um, moderate or um, mitigate uh, the for the excesses of, of uh, continuing to um, spew uh, fossil fuels into the atmosphere. You know, it's so kind of like. We got to do it all. You know, we got to do it all. We got to we got to decarbonize our economy, but we also have to change our relationship to the natural world. And the way you do that is, you know, like we said, working with keystone species like bison, beaver. I mean, beavers are great. You know, especially in a with increasing drought. I mean, yeah. it's a rainer. You know, to to support beavers, um, otters uh, on coastal areas and kelp forests, and 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 then. Um, even manatees, you know, in uh, um, coastal areas, those those are those are sort of uh, great reservoirs for of potential for carbon drawdown. So, uh, a couple of points. Uh, just, I think you had said what uh, it's 150 years Yosemite has been around. Uh, not uh, Yellowstone has been around. Yeah. So that that would have been 18. That would have been 1872. So that that actually predates Teddy Roosevelt. He he became president in 1900. Just as a point of clarification, right? Yeah, because Roosevelt, Roosevelt only became president in 1900. So that that that's one thing you can't <laughs> attribute to him. Um, uh, the second one uh, I wanted to say. So uh, when the bison do go off of Yellowstone or other protected areas. I would think that unless there's a, a, a real stampede of them, uh, it would probably be easier to, to, they should be easier to control, I would think, than say deer, correct? Mm -hmm. Because I hear in Texas, you know, I, my car has been hit a couple of times by deer uh, 
I mean, literally deer coming at the car with you not looking at it. Whereas a bison, you know, if, if you build, you know, a fence, they're not, they, they can't jump over a barbed wire fence. So, you know, I would think it would be much easier to keep uh, a bison herd, uh, uh, you know, healthy and, 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 and natural than it would uh, a lot of other species. Well, you're going to be surprised to hear this, but a, but a full-grown bison can actually clear a six-foot fence from, from a standing stop. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, I don't, you know, you can you can fence them in, but they have to be, like barbed wire doesn't do it. They have to okay. be, you know, they have like a, over a six-foot fence. Um, but the fact of the matter is that, um, you know, bison belong on the, know where they belong kind of like you know they go where they go to their natural habitat they're not unlike deer they're not going to be like wandering in downtown helena <laughs> you know what I mean? they're like they they go to the grasslands they go to the open uh rolling plains you know um i think we can actually trust bison to know if we let them uh recolonize their territory uh i think that would be a problem and i know since we've had bison outside of the park uh in the area where i'm sitting right now that uh, people um live uh people love having bison around the neighborhoods like on horse butte and so forth um there there really aren't conflicts with bison you know, it gets a lot of press, of course, when dumb tourists always do the wrong thing and get thrown by a bison in the park. That always makes for good news, right? But that, that doesn't happen with, um, you know, in, in a normal situation. That just happens because you've got five million tourists in Yellowstone National Park. So you used the term re-indigenizing uh, earlier. Um, is that a, a term, term that uh, takes a more holistic approach to... Uh, uh, you know, an ecosystem. So, I mean, you can't just dump uh, a herd of bison, let's say, into Arkansas and expect them to, to start. You have to sort of set the stage. Or can, or can the bison and the beavers, if left alone, like famously wolves were reintroduced into Yellowstone, what, 30 or some years ago, and they proved to have great beneficial effects in terms of, uh, uh, you know, thinning out the deer populations, which then meant that uh, different plants could grow uh, higher, which provided more shade, which enhanced wetlands, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, is, is that term re-indigenizing, is that a more holistic term? Well, I don't want to presume to represent what the authors of that article um, meant by the term because I think they're using it in a very specific way. Um, they're talking about, so if you look at the climate crisis as a crisis of relationship, right? We have to come back into proper relationship with turtle island, you know, with the land that we invade. Um, the best way to do that is, is to get bison out on the land. Bison have cascade, like with wolves, they have cascading a, a, a positive effects on other wildlife or like wildebeest on the Serengeti, you know. Um, what's the best way to get bison on the land? Well, to restore the relationship with, with tribes, restore the relationship between tribes and bison that co-evolve together, give, bison, give um, the tribes authority for taking care of bison outside of the park. We already have, you know, the National Bison Refuge, refuge um, in Montana is uh, managed by the, by the Kootenai Salish tribe. Uh, so we already have, uh, and, and I'm, I think most people don't, most people who don't live in the West and don't have a lot of relationship uh, or interactions with tribes um, probably don't, might be surprised to find out that most tribes have really good scientists, you know, and actually the United Nations is basically saying traditional ecological knowledge of, of tribal scientists is superior to ours when it comes to these types of issues. So it's a, it's a basically a, a matter of recognizing that the ecocide and genocide that we carried out were related and that if we're going to 
make up for one, we probably have to make up for the other. So we have to begin a process of reconciliation with the First Peoples. And I and what Buffalo Field Campaign believes is the, the best way to begin that process of reconciliation is to restore the relationship between tribes and Buffalo, because where that's happening, you're seeing cultural uh, regeneration and the tribes, the children, you know, are all of a sudden have a different kind of focus than, than they've had and their diets are improved. They're not eating fast food. They're actually eating the food that they evolved eating. Um, so I think um, the idea of re-indigenizing, the other thing they do in that article is, is lay out the legal framework uh, for how would you actually go about giving tribes this sort of authority. And it turns out that the Park Service has a sufficient authority itself. And, you know, the Park Service is now headed up by a uh, Native American, as is the Department of Interior headed up by a Native American. And um, so uh, they, they have instituted policies of basically deferring to tribes. You know, when tribes come up with proposals for how to do things, they should give that serious consideration. So I think, so basically that, that the whole point, I think, of that article was almost to encourage uh, a tribal solution uh, to, uh, for management of bison outside of the park. They also talk about in that article about giving tribes authority over wildlife inside the park. Politically, I think that's probably a non-starter. You know, people, American people are not going to, um, you know, I, the Park Service is doing what it can in, in celebrating the 150th anniversary and invited tribes to come in and set up teepees and do tours for people and everything. There's a tribal um, education center in the park now. So, you know, there's some of that, but as far as actually turning the park over to a tribe, I don't think that's going to happen. So does re-indigenizing also result in younger generations of Native Americans staying on their more indigenous lands rather than a diaspora out into the general so uh, American society or Canadian? Yeah, I, I don't think I can really speak to that. I don't know the answer to that. Okay, uh, so let's talk then about the future. Um, uh, both, uh, well, threefold. One, your own particular future within the Buffalo Field Campaign, your organization's future, and then the future of uh, the bison going heading towards mid-century here. Um, are you optimistic uh, on these fronts? Uh, <laughs> I, it, it's interesting because I, I did step away from sort of the activist community for a decade and I'm coming back into it in a very different way. I think that um, since Standing Rock, I think that Standing Rock was a real turning point and indigenous people around the world are sort of asserting themselves and, and being supported and finding allies. And I, and I feel like that's a natural and appropriate um, development in response to the climate crisis. I have had a career of dealing with scientific issues at the level of a forest or the level of a rangeland, the amount of uncertainty, you know, I think human hubris uh, kind of has defined a lot of our uh, development as a culture and, and our, our science. Um, I think there's so much more we don't know that we're discovering every day, like with trees being, having awareness, forests having awareness. I mean, you know, the idea of, uh, of trees being sentient beings um, 20 years ago was considered, you know, woo wee wah 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 and, and now it's good science, you know? Well, for like, example, aspen stands are considered a single individual, same as some, like, big fungi that spread out of a quarter of a mile or more. Yeah, and, this, and, the, and the sort of communication network and uh, mycelium layers of the earth, you know, if, if you start looking at this stuff, it's really kind of freaky, you know, like, this is a living organism and it even has like a, a brain and, yeah. you know, it's ways of, it has its own awareness and its own responses. Um, I'm optimistic, you know, I, I've always said I'm sure, sort of short-term pessimist, long-term optimist. And 
the long-term optimism is based on faith in nature, like what Thoreau said, you know, I've seen the foundations of the earth and I'm, I feel it's, it's going to, oh, it's going to do fine. It's going to live longer than us. Gaia, Gaia is being threatened. She's, she's basically facing a life crisis, a, 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 a wounding and, um, uh, a potentially fatal uh, threat. And so she's activating her immune defense system. And I feel that that's part of that is indigenous people rising up because they've never lost that, that proper relationship uh, with the larger organism, but also it's starting to inform and active, activate um, uh, settlers, you know, as well, people that look like you and me. Um, that's what, so, so I have faith that, and, and I talked to, a, I have a lot of indigenous um, uh, friends and allies and uh, who are, a lot of people are, I feel like are wiser than me. And so when I say this, I've, I've talked to them about it, that, that if you think about it and you sort of see what's really happening, you can, conclude that that Gaia will bring us to heal. If you remember the Hillary Clinton speech about super predators, well, we're the super predators when it comes to the climate crisis. And Gaia is much more, much higher intelligence than we are. She's a much more complex organism. And we're a part of that organism. And eventually she will bring us to heal. And I, and I really believe that, you know, like the pandemic is, is kind of a mild sort of first wave of that. Uh, reforming that relationship and bringing us into um, compliance with uh, um, uh, sort of her long-term interests. Uh, finally, uh, in a century or two from now, do you think that people will look back on the turn here of the second uh, into the third millennium? Uh, what what lessons do you think they will take from how uh, you know we and we we could we could say. Uh, uh, Western society, American, Europe, or whatnot. But as you said, th yeah. this isn't a, a blame game thing. Um, do you think people in the hundred or two hundred years are going to look back charitably on us? I mean, obviously, it depends of uh, you know how things play out. But uh, you know, what what is your sense of the future? Are we going to be seen as sort of ignorant savages by our descendants? Yeah, um, the way I see it is that. Um, human nature is good, right? So that's part of being Buddhist. We don't believe in that original sin crap. <laughs> you know, and, and, if you, and the way human nature is discussed in Christian culture and society is almost in a pejorative way. Oh, that, that's like, oh, that's just human nature, you know, when kids fight. Right? No, human nature is good. When you act against your better nature, that's what trauma is. You end up being, you end up with trauma. I think what people will look back is in, in sort of big picture and deep time to see that the Europeans, uh, through all the settlement, the whole discovery doctrine and Christianity and all that. Manifest got, destiny. Yeah, we got further and further away from our own human nature. We continued to, to act in ways that uh, were contrary to what we know is in, intuitively and in our hearts is best. And that uh, the climate crisis is basically going to force us to get back into alignment with our own uh, human nature, because human nature is nature. There's no separation between nature, big nature, and human nature. And that relationship is what needs to... So I think it's just going to be, they're going to look back at, a, at the Europeans as kind of like wayward children, you know, who got, who got kind of lost and uh, got too full of themselves and committed two fundamental errors. Number one, we decided that we were superior to indigenous people in every way. That, is, that has been proven now. It's very clear that that's not the or case. Or superior to other animals, in fact. And yeah, that, yeah certainly um, ecological, the ecological awakening or ecological consciousness that's awakening is, is, is a very prominent development. But then the other, but related to that is the other the other big mistake we made was that we actually could control nature. You know, when we split the atom, 
you know, President Truman said, now we control the forces of the universe. That's the province of gods, you know. We became like gods to ourselves, thinking that we could we could we could do it better with plastics and you know um, monoculture and everything like that. Somehow we decided that we could create an artificial world that was superior to the natural world. And, and those two things, you know, that we're superior and that we can do better than not nature, those are those were that's what's turned us into wayward children, and, and Gaia is calling us home. So basically, human beings should be stewards, not masses of the Earth. We should just see ourselves as part of a larger organism and figure out what our role in that is, right? Well, Tom, thank you for spending an hour or so speaking about this. Uh, I will link to the Buffalo Field campaign underneath this video. Anyone who's interested can contact you or the, the campaign. So. Thanks again for spending time with me. Thank you, Dan.